Chapter Twenty Five of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five. While this was taking place within, the tumult without had increased a thousandfold, and the din of cries and screams and blows and groans mingled in one wild shriek of human passion, hellish as if they rose from Phlegathon. But to my surprise, the roar of the cannon no longer drowned the rest and looking again from the window i saw all the outward defences in the hands of the populace the fortifications of the arsenal had only been completed so far as regarded the mere external works but even had they been as perfect as human ingenuity could have devised the small number of soldiers which were now within the gates would never have sufficed to defend so great a space from a multitude like that of the insurgents at the moment that i returned to my loophole the peasantry were pouring on every side into the inner court and the viceroy with not more than a hundred castilians was endeavouring in vain to repel them if ever what are commonly called prodigies of valour were really wrought that unhappy nobleman certainly did perform them fighting in the very front and making good even the open court of the arsenal against the immense body of populace which attacked it for nearly a quarter of an hour at length mere fatigue from such unwonted exertions seemed to overcome him and in making a blow at one of the peasants he fell upon his knees a dozen hands were raised to dispatch him but at the sight of his danger the castilians rallied and closing in saved him from the fury of the people while his faithful negro catching him in his arms bore him into the body of the building though certainly but ill-disposed towards the soldiery there was something in the chivalrous valour which the viceroy had displayed in these last scenes combined with the lenity he had shown to myself when brought before him which created an interest in my bosom that i will own greatly divided my wishes for the success of the oppressed catalonians the idea too entered my mind that by exerting my influence with garcias whom i still saw in the front of the insurgents i might obtain for the viceroy some terms of capitulation calling to little achilles to follow me then i snatched up the sword of the dead castilian and proceeding to the door which as i had expected was now open i ran out into the long corridor and thence began to search for the staircase that led down to the gate by which the viceroy must have entered on every side however i heard the cries of the soldiery who had now retreated into the building and were proceeding to take every measure for its defence to the utmost several times these cries misled me and it was not till i had followed many a turning and winding that i arrived at the head of the staircase half way down which i beheld the viceroy sitting on one of the steps evidently totally exhausted while scipio the negro kneeling on a lower step offered him a cup of wine and seemed pressing him to drink at the sound of my steps the slave started up and laid his hand upon his dagger but seeing me he gave a melancholy glance towards his lord and again begged him to take some refreshment unused to all exertion and enormously weighty the excessive toil to which the viceroy had subjected himself had left him no powers of any kind and he sat as i have described with his eyes shut his hand leaning on the step and his head fallen heavily forward on his chest without seeming to notice anything that was passing around him it was in vain that i made the proposal to parley with garcias he replied nothing and i was again repeating it hoping by reiteration to make him attend to what i said when one of his officers came running down from above my lord cried he the galleys answer the signal and from the observatory i see the boats putting off if your excellence makes haste you will get to the shore at the same moment they do and will be safe the viceroy raised his head at all events i will try said he they cannot say that i have abandoned my post while it was tenable let the soldiers take torches the officer flew to give the necessary directions and taking the cup from the negro the viceroy drank a small quantity of the wine after which he turned to me i am glad you are here said he they talk of my escape i do not think i can effect it but whether i live or die sir frenchman report me aright to the world 
now if you would come with us follow me but you might stay with safety they would not injure you i determined however to accompany him at least as far as the boats they talked of though i knew not how they intended to attempt their escape surrounded as the arsenal was by the hostile populace i felt convinced however that i should be in greater personal safety in the open streets than shut up in the arsenal where the first troop of the enraged peasantry who broke their way in might very possibly murder me without at all inquiring whether i was there as a prisoner or not at the same time i fancied that in case of the viceroy being overtaken if garcias was at the head of the pursuers i should have some influence in checking the bloodshed that was likely to follow while these thoughts passed through my brain half a dozen voices from below were heard exclaiming the torches are lighted my lord the torches are lighted and the viceroy rising began to descend leaning on the negro i followed with achilles and as we passed through the great hall sufficient signs of the enemy's progress were visible to make us hasten our flight the immense iron door was trembling and shivering under the continual and incessant blows of axes and crows with which it was plied by the people in spite of a fire of musketry that a party of the most determined of the soldiery was keeping up through the loopholes on the ground story and from the windows above a great number of the soldiers whose valour was secondary to their discretion had already fled down a winding staircase the mouth of which stood open at the farther end of the hall with an immense stone trap-door thrown back which when down doubtless concealed all traces of the passage below when we approached it only two or three troopers remained at the mouth holding torches to light the viceroy as he descended don jose said the viceroy in a faint voice addressing the officer who commanded the company which still kept up the firing from the windows call your men together let them follow me to the galleys but take care when you descend to shut down the stone door over the mouth of the stairs lock it and bar it as you know how and make haste i will but roll these barrels of powder to the door my lord replied the officer lay a train between them and place a minute match by way of a spigot and then will join your excellence with my trusty iron hearts who are picking out the fattest rebels from the windows should need be we will cover your retreat and as we have often tasted your bounty will die in your defence in dangerous circumstances there is much magic in a fearless tone and don jose spoke of death in so careless a manner that i could not help thinking some of the soldiers who had been most eager to light the viceroy were somewhat ashamed of their cowardly civility about forty of the bravest soldiers in the garrison who remained with the officer who had spoken would indeed have rendered the viceroy's escape to the boats secure but don jose was prevented from fulfilling his design we descended the stairs as fast as the viceroy could go and at the end of about a hundred steps entered a long excavated passage leading from the arsenal to the seashore cut through the earth and rock for nearly half a mile and lined throughout with masonry at the farther extremity of this were just disappearing as we descended the torches of the other soldiers who had taken the first mention of flight as an order to put themselves in security and had consequently led the way with great expedition in a moment or two after by what accident it happened i know not an explosion took place that shook the earth on which we stood and roared through the cavern as if the world were riven with the shock god of heaven they have blown themselves up cried the viceroy pausing but the negro hurried him on and we soon reached the sands under the cliffs to the left of the city to the cold chilliness of the vault through which we had hitherto proceeded now succeeded the burning heat of a cloudless sun in spain it was but spring but no one knows what some spring days are in barcelona except those who have experienced them and by the pale cheek haggard eye and staggering pace of the viceroy i evidently saw that if the boats were far off he would never be able to reach them we saw them however pulling towards the shore about three-quarters of a mile farther up and the very sight was gladdening four or five soldiers remained as i have said with their commander and lighted us along the gallery 
but the moment they were in the open air the view of the boats towards which their companions who had gone on before were now crowding was too much for the constancy of most of them and without leave or orders all but two ran forward to join the rest the tide was out and stretching along the margin of the sea a smooth dry sand offered a firm and pleasant footing but a multitude of large black rocks strewed irregularly about upon the shore obliged us to make a variety of turns and circuits doubling the actual distance we were from the boats the cries and shouts from the place of the late combat burst upon our ears the moment we had issued from the passage and sped us on with greater rapidity seeing that he could hardly proceed i took the left arm of the viceroy while his faithful negro supported him on the right and hurried him towards the boats but the moment after another shout burst upon our ear it was nearer far nearer than the rest and turning my head i beheld a body of the peasantry pursuing us and arrived at about the same distance from us that we were from the boats the viceroy heard it also and easily interpreted its meaning i can go no farther said he but i can die here as well as a few paces or a few yards beyond and he made a faint effort to draw his sword yet a little farther my lord yet a little farther cried the african they are a long way off still we are nearing the boats see the head boat is steering towards us yet a little farther for the love of heaven the unfortunate viceroy staggered on for a few paces more when his weariness again overcame him his lips turned livid his eyes closed and he fell fainting upon the sand running down as fast as i could to the sea i filled two of the large shells that i found with water and carried them back dashed the contents on his face but it was in vain and i went back for more when on turning round i saw a fresh party of the insurgents coming down a sloping piece of ground that broke the height close by it would have been base to have abandoned him at such a moment and i returned to his side with all speed the first of the peasantry were already within a few paces and their brows were still knit and their eyes still flashing with the ferocious excitement of all the deeds they had done during the course of that terrible morning as they rushed on i saw garcias a step or two behind and called to him loudly in french to come forward and protect the viceroy assuring him that he had wished the people well and even had been the means of saving my life the smuggler made no reply but starting forward knocked aside the point of a gun that one of the peasants had levelled at my head and catching me firmly by the arm held me with his gigantic strength while the people rushed on upon their victim the negro strode across his master and drew his dagger one of the insurgents instantly rushed upon him and fell dead at his feet another succeeded when the dagger broke upon his ribs the noble slave cast it from him and throwing himself prostrate on the body of his master died with him under a hundred wounds End of chapter 25chapter 26 of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 26 beware how you stand between a lion and his prey said garcias releasing my arm and let me tell you sir count it were a thousand times easier to tear his food from the hungry jaws of the wild beast than to save him from the fury of this oppressed people the patron and chief of all their oppressors you are wrong garcias you are wrong replied i since i have been a prisoner here at the arsenal i have had full opportunity to see and judge whether he wished to be your oppressor or not and on my honour no man would more willingly have done you justice and punished those who injured you had he been allowed to hear the evils that were committed under the name of his authority that then was his crime replied garcias he should have heard he should have known the wrongs and miseries of the people he governed all in life depends on situation and in his indolence was a crime a crime which has been deeply but not too deeply expiated believe me count louis that kings and governors who suffer injustice to be committed deserve and will ever meet a more tragic fall than those even who commit it themselves but see cried i 
they are going to mutilate the bodies for heaven's sake stop them and let them not show themselves utterly savages what matters it asked he the heads they are bound to strike off will never feel the indignity but speak to them if you will and try whether you can persuade them from their wrath ho oh, stand back my friends he continued addressing the people who even glared upon him with somewhat of fierceness in their look as he interrupted their bloody occupation hear what this noble frenchman has to say to you and respect him for he is my friend viva garcias shouted the people viva el librador and standing forward i endeavoured as well as i could to calm their excited feelings my good friend said i you all know me to be sincerely the well-wisher of catalonia and the cause of freedom many who are here present saw me dragged through the streets of barcelona no later than this morning tied like a slave and insulted as i went by the brutal soldiery your enemies and mine for no other cause but that i was a frenchman and that the french are friendly to the catalonians i therefore have good cause to triumph in your success and to participate in your resentment but there is a bound my friend within which resentment should always be confined to mark it as grand as noble as worthy of a great and generous people it is just it is right to punish the offender to smite the oppressor and to crush him with his own wrong a loud shout announced that this was the point where the angry flame still burned most furiously but continued i is it right is it just is it noble to insult the inanimate clay after the spirit has departed is it dignified is it grand is it worthy of a great and free people like the catalonians no no cried one or two voices amongst the better class of the insurgents do not insult the body no indeed proceeded i it is beneath a people who have done such great and noble deeds the moment you attempt to degrade that corpse by any unbecoming act what was an act of justice becomes an act of barbarity and instead of looking on that unhappy man as a sacrifice to justice all civilised people must regard him as the victim of revenge you my friend you i continued addressing the man who had been kneeling on the body for the purpose of cutting off the head with a long girdle knife and who still glared at it like a wolf disappointed of its prey you i am sure would be the last to sully the justice of the catalonians with a stain of cruelty a few hours ago this unhappy man possessed riches and power and friends and kindred all the warm blessings of human existence you have taken them from him all is not that punishment enough you have sent him to the presence of god to answer for his sins let god then judge him and reverencing the sanctity of that tribunal to which you yourselves have referred him take up the frail remains of earth and lay them side by side with the faithful the noble the generous-hearted slave whose self-devotion we all admire and whose death we all regret bear them silently to the high church and deliver them into the hands of some holy priest to pray that god may pardon him in heaven the faults which you have punished upon earth thus shall you know my friend that it is justice you seek not cruelty thus shall your friends esteem you your enemies fear you and your deeds of this day descend as an example to nations yet unborn in a multitude there is always a latent degree of good feeling amongst the majority which in moments of tumult and action is overborne by the more violent and excitable passions of human nature but once get the people to pause and listen and mingle with your speech a few of those talismanic words which compel the evil spirit vanity to the side of good and every better sentiment thus encouraged will come forth and often lead them to the greatest and noblest actions when i began to address the catalonians all i could obtain was bare attention but as they heard their own deeds spoken of and commended they gathered round me pressing one another for the purpose of hearing i gained more boldness as i found myself listened to and seeming to take it for granted that they possessed the feelings i sought to instil into them i gradually brought them to the sentiments i wished the great majority received with shouts the proposal of carrying the bodies to the cathedral and the rest dared not oppose the opinion of the many 
I had fancied Garcias cold, nay savage, from the check he had laid upon me at first, but the energy with which he pressed the execution of my proposal before the fickle multitude had time again to change, cleared him in my opinion, and we prepared to return to the city as friends. At this moment, however, I perceived the loss of my little companion Achilles, and mentioned the circumstance to Garcias, who gave orders to search for him. But the poor player was to be found nowhere, and I began to entertain serious apprehensions that, in case of his having fled, he might be massacred by the first body of the insurgents he encountered. Garcias instantly took advantage of this possibility, making it an excuse for positively prohibiting all promiscuous slaughter, and so great seemed his influence with the people, from the very extraordinary services he had rendered to their cause, that I doubted not his orders would be received as a law. The news of the Viceroy having been taken had, by this time, collected the great body of the insurgents round us, and on a proposal from Garcias they proceeded, in somewhat of tumultuous manner, to elect a council of twelve who were to have a supreme command of the army, as they called themselves, and to possess the power of life and death over all prisoners who might hereafter be taken. Garcias, as might naturally be expected, was appointed president of this council, and commander-in-chief of the army, and as a representative of the town of Lerida, the alcade of that city, was chosen, he having joined the insurgents from the first breaking out of the insurrection. Added to these were several popular and respectable citizens of Barcelona, with a wealthy merchant of Tarragona, and, much to my surprise, I was myself eventually proposed to the people, and my name received with a shout which, from having opposed the fury of the populace in its course, I had not at all expected. Though whoever has once guided a popular assembly, even against their inclination, becomes in some degree a favourite with them, this was not, I believe, the sole cause of the confidence they reposed in me. The idea of assistance from France was their great support in their present enterprise, and without staying to inquire whether he possessed any official character, the very knowledge that they had a Frenchman in their councils gave them a sort of confidence in themselves, which their ill-cemented union required not a little. Involved as I now was in the insurrection, I did not refuse the office they put upon me, and my reason was very simple. I hoped to do good, and to act as a check upon men whose passions were still excited. When all this was concluded, a sort of bier was formed of pikes bound together, and the bodies of the viceroy and his slave placed thereon. Six stout Barcelonese porters raised it from the ground, and marched on. The insurrectionary council followed next, and then the populace, armed with a thousand varied sort of weapons, and thus, in half-triumphant, half-funereal procession, we returned towards the city. As we went, Garcias, with a rapidity of thought and clearness of arrangement, which eminently fitted him for a leader in such great but irregular enterprises as that in which he was now engaged, sketched out to me his plans for organising the people, maintaining the civil government of the province, repelling any attempt to reimpose the yoke which the nation had cast off, raising funds for the use of the common weal, and gradually restoring that order and tranquillity which had of course been lost in the tumultuous scenes of the last two days. He took care also to dispatch messengers in every direction through the town, bearing strict commands to all the various posts of the insurgents that no more blood should be spilt without form of trial, and two of the members of the council were also detached on a mission to the Corregidor and other civil officers of the city, requiring their union with the great body of the Catalonian people for the purpose of maintaining and cementing the liberties which they had that day reconquered. His wise conduct in both respects produced the most beneficial effects. The news of the cessation of bloodshed spread like lightning through the city, and induced many of the Catalonian nobility, who previously had not known whether the insurrection was a mere democratical outrage, or a really patriotic effort for the good of all, to come forth from their houses and give their hearty concurrence to the enterprise, whose leaders showed so much moderation. 
At the gate of the cathedral, also, we were met by the corregidor and all the chief officers of the city, accompanied by a large posse of alguacils and halberdiers, attached to their official station. These officers, as a body, declared their willingness to cooperate with the liberators of their country, for though they had received their offices from the king of Spain, they were Catalonians before they were Spaniards. This annunciation produced a shout from the people, which gave notice to the chapter of the cathedral of our approach, and coming forth in their rich robes, they received with the solemn chant of the church the bodies of the unhappy viceroy and his slave. When the corpses had been laid before the high altar, the bishop himself came forward to the portal, and addressed the people, who heard him with reverential attention. While the leaders of the revolution, which had just been effected, clothed indeed in wild and various vestments, but dignified in air and look, by the consciousness of great deeds spread on one side of the gate, and the nobility and high municipal officers ranged themselves on the other, leaving room for the populace to catch the words of the prelate. "'My children,' said the old man, "'you have this day done great and fearful deeds, and sure I am that the motives which impelled ye thereunto were such as ye could in conscience acknowledge and maintain. I myself can witness how long ye endured oppressions and injuries, almost beyond the patience of mortal men. Your children and brothers slaughtered, your wives and sisters insulted.' and God's altars overturned and profaned. May heaven forgive ye for the blood ye have spilt, but as some of the innocent must have perished with the guilty, I enjoin you all to keep to-morrow as a strict and rigorous fast, to confess you of your sins, and to receive absolution, after which may God bless and prosper you, and strengthen you in the right. The good bishop's speech was received with shouts by the populace, who took it for granted that it proceeded entirely from love and affection towards them, though, individually, I could not help thinking that there was a slight touch of fear in the business, as the prelate was well aware that in pulling down one house the neighbouring ones are very often injured, and perhaps he might think that in overthrowing the edifice of Castilian dominion in Catalonia, the populace might shake the power of the church also. I know not whether I did him wrong, but of course I did not give the benefit of my thoughts to any of the rest, and when he had done, we took our departure from the cathedral, and proceeded towards the viceroy's palace, which Garcias named for his headquarters. As we went, we were encountered by a large body of the insurgents, who had just concluded the pillage of a house in the same street, belonging to the Marquis de Villafranca, general of the galleys. They were of the lowest order of the populace, and we heard that a good deal of blood had been shed, and various enormities committed by them, which, as yet, it would have been dangerous to punish. Advancing with loud shouts, they hailed us as their brother patriots, from which appellation the better part of the insurgents were somewhat inclined to shrink, receiving their fraternal salutations, with much the shy air of a parvenu when visited by his poor relations. I must say, however, that never did a more brutal rabble meet my sight. Amongst other instances of their savage ignorance was one which at the same time strongly displayed the spirit of the vulgar Catalonians. In rifling the Marquis de Villafranca's house, they had found, amongst other rare and curious articles which that officer took great delight in collecting, a small bronze figure representing a negro, the body of which contained a clock. At the same time, the works were so contrived as to make the eyes of the figure move, and when the mob surrounded the table on which it was placed, the little negro continued to roll his eyes round and round upon them, in so bold and menacing a manner, that the whole multitude were frightened and dared not approach. From this love of study, and search for everything that was curious and antique, it had long been rumoured amongst the lower orders that the Marquis, had addicted himself to magic, and they instantly fixed upon this ingenious piece of clockwork as his familiar demon. Under this impression it was long before any one dared to touch it, as, after having signed it with the cross, and even held up a crucifix before it, it still continued to roll its eyes upon them, with most sacrilegious obstinacy. At length one more courageous than the rest dashed to pieces the glass which covered it, and seizing hold of the unfortunate clock, 
tied it to the end of a pike and carried it out into the street when we encountered them the first thing we beheld was this bronze figure borne above the heads of the people they instantly exhibited it to us with great triumph assuring us that they had caught the marquis de villafranca's familiar and were about to carry it to the chief inquisitor that it might be consigned to its proper place with all convenient dispatch for my own part i could scarcely refrain from laughing and as garcias seemed to take the matter quite seriously i explained to him in french that the supposed familiar was nothing but a piece of mechanism ingenious enough but not at all uncommon he cut me short however praised the crowd for their zeal and bade them by all means carry the demon to the inquisitor and then disperse for the night reasoning with such a mob as that said he as he went on is as vain as talking to the winds or seas the only way of managing them is to leave them in possession of all their prejudices and follies but to turn those prejudices and follies to the best purposes one can you see that cart monsieur de l'orme with its great clumsy wheels which are not half so good as the light wheels that we have in navarre and aragon but if i wanted to send a load quickly to the port i would not think of sitting down to take off those wheels to make lighter and to put them on but would of course make use of the cart as i found it thus when you want to guide a multitude never attempt to give them new ideas but take advantage of those which they have already got we had now arrived at the viceregal palace and leaving garcias to make what arrangements he thought proper for the accommodation of the five hundred men which he had brought with him from lerida and for organizing the people of barcelona into a sort of irregular militia the insurrectionary council repaired to a great hall and with the corregidor and alcade sat till midnight deciding on the fate of all those persons that the various parties of the armed multitude thought fit to bring before it the task was somewhat a severe one for every person that did not know another brought him before the council if he could and if he could not he was himself brought their zeal however in this respect began to slacken as night fell and it was only the more resolute and exasperated part of the insurgents that continued their perquisitions for castilians and other suspected persons patrolling the street of the city in bodies of tens and twelves and making every one they met give an account of himself and his occupations as it was the sincere wish of every member of the council to allay the popular fury and stop the effusion of blood various extraordinary shifts were we obliged to make for the purpose of saving many of the poor wretches that were brought before us from the more inveterate and bloodthirsty of the insurgents the part we had to play was certainly a very difficult one for we were surrounded by men over whom we had not the check of long established control and whose inflamed passions and long smothered revenge was not half quenched with all the gore that had already drenched the streets of barcelona blood was still their cry and they contrived to find out almost every individual who had been in any way connected with the castilian government of the province and drag him before us our very principal object was to check their indiscriminate cruelty and yet if we refused in every instance to gratify them in their revenge it was likely we should annul our own authority and that the populace would betake themselves again to the massacres which we sought to prevent under these circumstances upon the plea of weariness and want of time to examine thoroughly we committed greater part of the unfortunate wretches whom we were called to notice to the government prison sending off the most violent of the insurgents to renew their patrol in the streets upon the pretence of fearing that during their absence some of the more obnoxious persons should escape the prison we took care to surround with a strong guard of the men from lerida the major part of whom had served in the old catalonian militia and were consequently in a very good state of subordination looking up also to garcias almost as a god from his having led them on two such signal victories as that which they had achieved that day and the morning of the day before at midnight the corregidor rose and addressing me by the name which garcias had given me the count de l'orme requested me to lodge at his house 
as most probably I had not apartments prepared in the city. I willingly accepted his hospitality, and escorted by a strong body of alguacils, we proceeded to his dwelling, where a very handsome chamber was assigned to me, and I was preparing to go to rest after a day of such excessive excitement and fatigue, when I was interrupted by someone knocking at the door. I bade him come in, and to my great surprise I beheld my little attendant, Achilles, completely dressed in Spanish costume, though, to earn the truth, his eau de chausse came a good way below his knees, and his justo corps hung with rather a slovenly air upon his haunches. His hat, too, which was ornamented with a high plume, fell so far over his forehead as to cover his eyebrows, which were themselves none of the highest, and, in short, his whole suit seemed as if it intended to eat him up. "'Ah, my dearly beloved lord and master,' cried the little player, "'thank God that when I celebrate my February in memory of my deceased friends, I shall not have to call upon your name among the number, though I little thought that you would get out of the hands of that dreadful multitude so safely as you have done.' I welcomed my little attendant, as his merits deserved, and, congratulating him on his fine new feathers, asked him how he had contrived to escape the fury of the people, without even having been brought before the council. "'Why, to speak sooth, I escaped but narrowly,' answered little Achilles. "'And but that my lord loves not the high and tragic style, I could tell my tale like Corneille and Routreau. Ay, and make it full, full of horrors. But to keep to the lowly walk in which it is your will to chain my soaring spirit, when I saw that poor unhappy viceroy faint, and a great many folks coming along the shore with lances and muskets and knives, and a great many other things which are occasionally used for worse purposes than to eat one's dinner, I looked out for a place where my meditations were not likely to be interrupted by the clash of cold iron, and seeing none such upon the shore, I betook me to a small piece of green turf that came slanting down from the hill to the beach, and there I began to run faster than I ever plied my legs on an upland before. The exercise I found very pleasant, and God knows how long I should have continued it, especially as some of the folks on the beach, seeing me run, pointed me out with their muskets, that their friends might admire my agility, and I began to hear something whistle by my head every now and then, in a very encouraging manner. But just when I got to the top of the hill, plump, I came upon a mob twice as big as the other. Instantly they seized me, and asked me a thousand questions, which I could not answer, for I did not understand one of them. When suddenly one fellow got hold of me, threw me down, and— Blessed be the sound from henceforth for ever, amen, though he held a knife to my throat and stretched out his arm in a very unbecoming manner, he at the same time muttered to himself, Diantre, between his teeth, in a way that none but a true-born Frenchman could have done it. Diantre, cried he, grasping my throat. Diantre, replied I, in the same tone. Diantre, exclaimed he, letting go his hold, and opening his mouth wider than before. Diantre, repeated I, devilish glad to get rid of him. Foutre, the fellow mocks me, cried he, drawing back his knife to run it into my gizzard. Ah, exclaimed I, if your poor dear father could see you now, about to murder me, what would he say? Diable, cried he, are you a Frenchman? Certainly, answered I, nothing less though a little one and do you know my father exclaimed he catching me in his arms and hugging me very fraternally not a whit answered i i wish i did for then possibly you would for his sake show me how i can save my throat from these rude ruffians that i will for our country's sake answered he and helping me up he told some half-dozen dogged-looking fellows who had remained to help him to stick me a long story full of spanish oses and anoses which seemed to satisfy them very well for instead of running me through they hugged me till i was nearly strangled crying out viva la francia all the while after this my companion who is the corregidor's french cook 
gave me a green feather, which has ever since proved the best feather in my cap, for this green, it seems, is the colour of the Catalonians, and since I put it in my hat, every one I have met has made me a low bow. The cook and myself swore eternal amity on the field of battle, and instead of going on to murder the viceroy by which nothing was to be got, we went back and joined the good folks who had just broken into the palace of the general of the galleys. There had been a little assassination done before we came up, but the general himself had got off on board his ships, and the multitude were taking care of his goods and chattels for him. I entered into their sentiments with a fellow feeling, which is quite surprising, and while great part of them were standing staring at a foolish little black figure that rolled its eyes, and were swearing that it was first cousin to Beelzebub, I got hold of a drawer in which were these pretty things, and he produced a string of clear-set diamonds of inestimable value. These I brought away for your lordship, he added. They are too good for me, and I had just heard you were safe and sound, and a great man amongst the rebels. For my part, I satisfied myself with a handful or two of commoner trash in the shape of gold pieces, and this suit of clothes, with a few lace shirts and other articles of apparel, which I thought you might want. I had by this time got into bed, but I could not refrain from examining the diamonds, which were certainly most splendid. After I had done, I returned them to Achilles, telling him, of course, that I could not accept of anything so acquired, upon which he took them back again very coolly, saying, "'Very well, my lord, then I will keep them myself. Times may change, and your opinion, too. If I had not taken them, some Catalonian rebel would.' and therefore I will guard them safely as lawful plunder. And so saying, he left me to repose. End of chapter 26「fatigued was I that the night passed like an instant, and when Achilles came to wake me the next morning, I could scarcely believe I had slept half an hour. The good little player returned instantly, as he began to dress me, to the subject of the diamonds, with the value of which he seemed well acquainted, and as he found me positive in my determination to appropriate no one article of his plunder, except a rich laced shirt or two, which had belonged to the Marquis de Villafranca, and was a very convenient accession to my wardrobe he requested that at all events i would mention his possession of the diamonds to no one with this i willingly complied as i felt that i had no right to use the generous offer he had made me against himself before i was dressed a message was conveyed to me from the corregidor stating that as we should probably be occupied at the council till late he had ordered some refreshment to be prepared for us before we went and farther that he waited my leisure for a few minutes' conversation with me. I bade the servant stay for a moment, and then followed him to the corregidor's eating-room, where I was not at all displeased to find a very substantial breakfast, for not having eaten anything since the meal which the viceroy's negro had conveyed to me in prison, I was not lightly tormented with the demon of hunger. The corregidor received me with a great deal more profound respect than I found myself entitled to, and seating me at the table helped me to various dishes which did great honour to the skill and taste of achilles friend the cook after a little the servants were sent away and the officer addressed me with an important and mysterious tone upon the views and determinations of france i am well aware monsieur le comte de lorme said he that the utmost secrecy and discretion are required in an agent of your character and that of course you are bound to communicate with no one who cannot show you some authority for so doing but if you will look at that letter from m de noyer one of your ministers and written also as you will see by the express command of his eminence of richelieu you will have no longer i am sure any hesitation of informing me clearly what aid and assistance your government intends to give us in our present enterprise I took the letter which he offered, but replied without opening it, 
i am afraid sir that you greatly mistake the character in which i am here you must look upon me simply as a french gentleman whom accident has conducted to your city unauthorized and indeed incompetent to communicate with anybody upon affairs of state and probably more in the dark than yourself in regard to what aid assistance or countenance the french government intends to give to the people of catalonia the corregidor shook his head and opened his eyes and seemed very much astonished after falling into a reverie however for a moment or two he began to look wiser and replied well sir i admire your prudence and discretion and doubtless you act according to the orders of your government but at the same time i must beg that when you write to france you will inform his eminence of richelieu that the catalonian people are not to be trifled with and that having under promises of assistance from the french government thrown off the castilian yoke we expect that france will immediately realize her promises or we must apply to some other power for more substantial aid although i once more inform you my dear sir answered i that you entirely mistake my situation yet at the same time i shall be very happy to bear any communication you may think fit to the cardinal de richelieu and in the meantime set your mind quite at ease about the assistance you require the french government depend upon it will keep to the full every promise which has been made you it is too much in the interest of france to alienate catalonia from the dominions of king philip to leave a doubt of her even surpassing your expectations in regard to the aid you hope for nay this is consoling me most kindly cried the corregidor persisting in attributing to me the character of a diplomatist in spite of all my abnegation thereof may i communicate what you say to the members of the council and the chief nobility of the province as my private opinion decidedly replied i but not in the least as coming from one in a public capacity which would be grossly deceiving them my dear young friend said the corregidor rising and embracing me with the most provoking self-satisfaction in all his looks doubt not my discretion i understand you perfectly and will neither commit you nor myself depend upon it as to your return to france there is not a merchant in the town who will not willingly put the best vessel in the harbour at your command when you like but if you wish to set out instantly there is a brigantine appointed to sail for marseilles this very day at high water which takes place at noon our dispatches for the cardinal shall be prepared directly i will superintend the embarkation of your sea store and though sorry to lose the assistance of your wise counsel i am satisfied that your journey will produce the most beneficial effects to the general cause as i now saw that the corregidor had perfectly determined in his own mind that i should bear the character of an agent of the french government whether i liked it or not i was fain to submit and take advantage of the opportunity of returning to my own country with all speed it was therefore arranged that i should depart by the brigantine for marseilles and having seen achilles and ascertained that he would rather accompany me to france than stay beside the flesh-pots of egypt i gave him twenty louis from my little stock and bade him embark with all speed after having bought me some clothes through the intervention of his friend the cook i then proceeded with the corregidor to the viceregal palace on each side of the grand entrance were tied a number of horses apparently lately arrived heated and dusty and it appeared to me stained with blood there was a good deal of bustle and confusion too in the halls and passages persons pushing in and out parties of six and seven gathered together in corners and various other signs of some new event having happened we passed on however to the hall in which the council had assembled the night before and here we found that it was again beginning to resume its sitting have you heard the news cried the alcade of lerida our horsemen have defeated a party of a hundred aragonese cavalry who were coming to the city not knowing the revolution which had taken place the whole troop has been slain or dispersed and its leader brought in a prisoner at this moment garcias beckoned me across the room and leading me to one of the windows he spoke to me with a rambling kind of manner 
very different from the general clearness of his discourse, asking me a great many questions concerning the corregidor, his treatment of me, and all that had passed, of which I gave him a clear account, telling him my determination to depart for France immediately. "'You do right,' said he, somewhat abruptly. "'You might become involved more deeply than you could wish with the politics of our province. "'Did you look into the strong-room, to the right, at the bottom of the stairs, as you came up?' "'No,' replied I, somewhat surprised at his strange manner. "'Why do you ask?' "'Because if you had done so, you would have seen an old friend,' replied Garcias, biting his lip. "'The Chevalier de Montenero, who lives near you, at the White House below—' "'I know, I know who you mean,' cried I. "'What of him?' "'Why, he has been taken prisoner this morning,' replied Garcias, "'by one of the most deeply injured and most cruelly revengeful of our cavaliers. "'He is known to have been a dear friend of the late Viceroy, "'with whom he served in New Spain, "'and they demand that he be brought out into the square and shot without mercy.' "'They shall shoot me first, replied I. "'Indeed?' said Garcias composedly, and then added a moment after, and me too. I owe the chevalier thanks for having sheltered me when I was pursued by the douaniers, and though he spake harshly of my trade, he shall not find me ungrateful. But see, the council are seating themselves. Go to them. Make them as long a speech as you can about your going to France. Avoid, if possible, denying any more that you are an agent of that government. You have done so once, which is enough. Let the corregidor persuade them, and himself, of what he likes. But, at all events, keep them employed, till I come back, upon any other subject than the prisoners. I go to collect together some of my most resolute and trusty fellows, to back us in case of necessity. Quick, to the table. The alcade is rising to speak." I advanced, and while Garcias left the hall, I addressed the council without seating myself, apologising to the alcade, who was already on his feet, for pre-engaging his audience, and stating the short time I had to remain amongst them as an excuse for my doing so. I then, with as lengthy words and as protracted emphasis as I could command, went on, offering to be the bearer of any message, letter, or communication to the government of France at the same time promising to carry to my own country the most favourable account of all their proceedings. I dilated upon their splendid deeds and their generous sentiments, but I fixed the whole weight of my eulogy upon their moderation in victory, and then darted off to a commendation of mercy and humanity in general, showing that it was always the quality of great and generous minds, and that men who had performed the most splendid achievements in the field— and evinced the greatest sagacity in the cabinet, had always shown the greatest moderation to their enemies when they were in their power. Still Garcias did not come, and I proceeded to say that by evincing his magnanimous spirit, the Catalonians bound all good men to their cause, and that it would become not only a pleasure, but an honour and a glory to the nation who should assist them in their quarrel, and maintain them in their freedom. At the end of this tirade my eyes turned anxiously towards the door, for both topics and words began to fail me. But Garcias did not appear, and I was obliged to return to my journey to France. I begged them, therefore, to consider well the dispatches they were about to send, and at the same time to have them made up with all convenient dispatch, requesting that they would themselves give a full detail of what had already been done, of what they sought to do, and what they required from France, and, after having exhausted my whole stock of sentences, I was at last obliged to end by calling them the brave, the moderate, the magnanimous Catalonians. What between the acclamation that was to follow this, for men never fail to applaud their own praises, and any discussion which might arise concerning these dispatches, I hoped that Garcias would have time to return, but, at all events, I could not have manufactured a sentence more, if my life had been at stake. I was, however, disappointed in my expectations. The magnanimous Catalonians did not, indeed, neglect to shout, but the alcade of Lerida, who was one of those men whose own business is always more important than that of anyone else, rose, 
immediately after the noise had subsided, and represented to the council that they were keeping one of their most active and meritorious partisans, Gil Moreno, waiting with his prisoner, and that from the nature of the case, as he conceived it, five minutes would be sufficient to decide upon their course of action. He then ended with proposing that before any other business whatever was entered upon, the prisoner should be brought before the council. This was received with such a quick and cordial assent from all the members of the council, that it would have been worse than useless to resist it, and I was compelled to hear, unopposed, the order given for Gil Moreno to bring his prisoner to the council chamber. The Catalonian had probably been waiting with some impatience for this summons, and the moment after it was given he presented himself before the council. If ever relentless cruelty was expressed in a human countenance, it was in his. He was a short man, very quadrate in form, with large disproportioned feet and hands, and a wide open chest over which now appeared a steel corslet. His complexion was as dingy as a moor's, and his features in general large but not ill-formed. His eyes, however, were small, black as jet, and sparkling like diamonds, and his forehead, though broad and high, was extremely protuberant and heavy, while a deep wrinkle running between his eyebrows, together with a curve downwards in the corner of his mouth, and a slight degree of prominence of the under jaw, gave his face a bitter sternness of expression, which was not at all softened by a sinister inward cast of his right eye. Behind him was brought in, between two armed Catalonians, and followed by a multitude of others, the Chevalier, or, as the Spaniards designated him, the Conde de Montenero. His arms were tied tightly with ropes, but the tranquillity of his looks, the calmness of his step, and the dignity of his whole demeanour were unaltered, and he cast his eyes round the council slowly and deliberately, scanning every countenance till his look encountered mine. The expression of surprise which his countenance then assumed is not easily to be described. I thought even that the sudden sight of one he knew, among so many hostile faces, called up, before he could recollect other feelings, even a momentary glance of pleasure, but it was like a sunbeam struggling through wintry clouds, lost before it was distinctly seen, and his brow knit into somewhat of a frown as he ran his eye over the other members of the council. "'Speak, Gil Moreno,' said the alcade of Lerida, who, being the first person that had received the news of the Chevalier's capture, had appropriated it to himself as an affair which he was especially called upon to manage. What report have you to make in the Supreme Council of Catalonia? A short one, answered Moreno, roughly. On my patrol this morning, two miles from the city gate, I met with a body of Aragonese horse. I bade them stand and give the word when they gave the king, and I instantly attacked them, killed some, dispersed the rest, and took their captain. According to the orders given out last night, I brought him to the council, and now, because he is a known friend of the tyrant who died yesterday, was taken in arms against Catalonian freedom, and is in every way an enemy to the province, I demand that he be turned out into the plaza, and shot, as he deserves. "'And what reason can the prisoner give why this should not be the case?' demanded the alcade, turning to the chevalier. "'A few,' answered he with somewhat of a scornful smile, and those of such a nature that, from the constitution of this self-named council, they are not very likely to be received. The laws of arms, the common principles of right and justice, the usages of all civilised nations, and the feelings and notions of all men of honour. It might easily be supposed that such a speech was not calculated, particularly, to prejudice the council in favour of the speaker, and I would have given much more to have stopped it in its course. But just as the Chevalier ended, my mind was greatly relieved by the reappearance of Garcias, who now took his seat by the side of the corregidor, while the alcade replied, "'Such reasons, sir,' answered he, "'must remain vague and insignificant, without you can show that they apply to your case, which, as yet, you have not attempted to prove.' "'The application is so self-evident,' said I, interposing, "'that it hardly requires to be pointed out. "'If the Catalonians are a separate people, as they declare themselves, 
and at war with Philip, king of Castile, they are bound to observe the rights of nations, and to treat well those prisoners they take from their enemy. The common principles of right and justice require that every man should be proved guilty of some specific crime before he be condemned. The usages of all civilized nations sufficiently establish that no man is criminal for bearing arms, except it be against the land of his birth, or the government under which he lives, and the feelings of men of honor must induce you to respect, rather than to blame, the man who does his utmost endeavor in favor of the monarch whom he serves. "'Ho, ho, Sir Frenchman!' cried Moreno, glaring upon me with eyes, the cast in which was changed to a frightful squint by the vehemence of his anger. "'Come you here to prate to us about the laws of nations and the feelings of honour? Know that the Catalonians feel what is due to themselves, and their own honour, better than you or any other of your country can instruct them? Know that they will have justice done upon their oppressors, and if you, Frenchmen, do not like it, we care not for you, and can defend our own rights with our own hands. Once and again I demand the death of this prisoner, and if the council, as they choose to call themselves, do not grant it. What then? thundered Garcias. The council, as they choose to call themselves, I say the council as the Catalonian people have called them and if they do not grant the death of the prisoner what then why then his life is mine and i will take it answered moreno drawing a pistol from his belt and aiming it at the head of the chevalier who stood as firm and unblenching as a rock i was at the bottom of the table opposite to me stood moreno and the chevalier and without the thought of a moment i vaulted across and seized the arm of the catalonian it was done like lightning, almost before I knew it myself, and feeling that he could no longer hit the chevalier, the bloodthirsty villain struggled to turn the muzzle of the pistol upon me. A good many people pressed round us, embarrassing me by striving to aid me, and getting the pistol near my head, Moreno fired. The ball, however, did not injure me, but just grazing my neck, went on and struck the alcade of Lerida on the temple. He started up from his chair, fell back in it, and expired without uttering a word. "'By heaven, he has killed one of the council!' cried Garcias. "'Seize him! He shall die by St. James!' But Moreno turned to the crowd who filled that end of the hall. "'Down with this self-elected council!' cried he. "'Down with them! They would make worse slaves of us than the Castilians had done. Who will stand by Moreno?' "'I will! I will!' cried each of the two who had entered with him to guard the chevalier. "'I will,' uttered another voice behind him. But at the same instant the whole crowd, upon whom he had mistakenly relied, but who were, in fact, the most certain followers of Garcias, threw themselves upon Moreno and those who had expressed themselves of his party, and in a moment the whole four were tied hand and foot, as surely as they had tied the chevalier. "'I say, down with those who would introduce dissension and insubordination into the new government of Catalonia,' cried Garcias. "'Members of the council,' he added, "'whatever services I may have rendered, and which I trust somewhat surpass those of this rebel to your authority, I seek no more than that share of influence which the people have bestowed upon me, in common with yourselves. And when I propose that the Conde de Montenero shall be well treated, and his life spared, I do so merely as one of your own body, possessing but a single voice out of twelve. Let us, however, determine upon this directly, that we may proceed to the more important business of the dispatches to be sent to France. Give me your votes. Whatever might be the tone of moderation which Garcias assumed, his influence with the people was evidently so powerful that, of course, it extended in some degree to the council and their votes were instantly given in favour of what he proposed. The next consideration became how to dispose of the chevalier. Everyone present knew the unstable basis on which their authority rested, and in case of any change in the popular feeling, it was evident that the lives of all the prisoners would be the first sacrifice offered at the shrine of anarchy. A good deal of vague conversation passed upon the subject, and finding that everyone hesitated to make the proposition, which probably everyone wished, 
I took it upon myself and proposed that, as an act of magnanimity, which a whole world must admire and respect, they should liberate the Chevalier de Montenero and every other person attached to the Castilian government, merely taking the precaution of conveying them to the frontier of Catalonia. At the same time, I said, those Catalonians who were last night committed to prison upon frivolous accusations can be again examined. If not guilty of serious crimes, let them also be freed. Thus, the last thing I shall see before returning to my own country will be the greatest act of moderation which a victorious nation ever performed in the first excitement of its success. While I spoke, the eyes of Gil Moreno, who had not been removed from the hall, glared upon me as if he could have eaten my heart. And when the council gave a general assent to the proposal, he turned away with a groan of disappointed rage, biting his upper lip with the teeth of the under jaw, till the contortion of his face was actually frightful. On hearing the decision of the council, the chevalier advanced a step, and addressed a few words to them. "'Catalonians,' said he, "'you have acted in a different manner from that which I expected, and I therefore tell you what I never would have done while the sword was suspended over my head, that I came not here with intentions hostile to your liberties. I knew not of any revolt having taken place in this province, although I had heard rumours that many galling oppressions had been inflicted on the people.' My object in coming was to see an ancient companion in arms, who was the viceroy of this province, and I came by his own invitation to assist him with my poor advice in controlling the irregularities and enormities of the undisciplined soldiery with which a bad minister had encumbered his government. By his request also I brought with me from Aragon a troop of guards, on whose good conduct he could rely, they having served under my command in Peru. Were my hands free, I could show you a letter from the Viceroy in which he commiserates your sufferings, and bitterly complains of the insubordination of the troops. I hear that you have slain him. If so, God forgive you, for he wished you well. In regard to your revolt from the crown of Spain, depend upon it, you will be compelled, sooner or later, to return to the dominion of King Philip. It is not that I would speak in favour of the Count Duke Olivares, he continued, seeing an irritable movement in the council. That bad minister has injured me as well as you, and has been the cause of my having for years quitted Spain, wherein I had once hoped to have made my country. But still, by language, by manners, by geographical situation, Catalonia is an integral part of Spain, and— We will spare you the trouble, sir interrupted the corregidor of saying any more we have cast off the yoke of spain and by the aid of god we will maintain our independence as a separate people but should not that be granted us we would have king philip know that sooner than return to the dominion under which we have suffered so much we will give ourselves to any other nation capable of supporting by force of arms our division from spain let the alguaciles untie the prisoners hands Shortly after the chevalier had begun to speak, Garcias had quitted the hall, and he now returned, announcing that he had, with that prompt energy which peculiarly characterized him, already prepared a horse and escort for the Conde de Montenero, which would carry him safely to the limits of Catalonia. The chevalier bowed to the council, glanced his eyes towards me, of whom, since his first entrance, he had taken no more notice than he bestowed on the person least known to him at the table, and then followed Garcias from the hall. I could not resist my desire to speak to him, and making a sudden pretence to leave the council, I pursued the steps of the chevalier and his conductor to the small room in which he had been formerly confined. Garcias was turning away from him as I approached, saying, "'The horse shall be up in an instant, but do not show yourself to the people till the last moment.' As he went, I entered, and the chevalier turned immediately to me, with that sort of frigid politeness that froze every warmer feeling of my heart. "'I have to thank you, sir,' said he, "'for my life, which is valuable to me, not merely as life, but from causes which you may one day know. A few years, just now, are of more consequence to me than I once thought they ever could be, 
I therefore, sir, return you my thanks for interposing both your voice and your person this day to save me from death. Monsieur de Montenero, replied I, there has been a time when your manner to me would have been very different, but I must rest satisfied with the consciousness of not meriting your regard less than I did then. I am sorry, sir, replied he, that you compel me to look upon you in any other light than as a stranger who has interposed to save my life. But, as it is so, allow me to say that something else than mere assertion is necessary to convince me, on a subject which we had better not speak upon. Could you give anything better than assertion, I declare to heaven, that your own father would not have the same joy in your exculpation from guilt, nay, not half so much as I should? And there shone in his eye a momentary beam of that kindness with which he once regarded me, that convinced me what he said was true. Monsieur de Montenero, replied I, the reasons for my silence are removed, and I can give you something better than assertion. Then do, in God's name, cried he, and relieve my mind from a load that has burdened it for months. How you came here, or what you do here, I know not, but there is certainly some mystery in your conduct, which I cannot comprehend. Explain it all, then, Louis, if ever the affection with which you once seemed to regard me was real. I grasped his hand, for that one word, Louis, reawakened by the magic chain of association, all that regard in my bosom which his coldness and suspicion had benumbed, and in a moment more I should have told him enough to satisfy him that his doubts had been unfounded. But it seemed as if heaven willed that that story was never to be told, for just as I was about to speak, Garcias returned in haste. "'The horse is at the gate,' said he, "'and the guard prepared. "'Mount, senor, with all speed, and out by the Rose's gate, "'for Moreno's people have heard of his arrest.' and are gathering at the other end of the town. Louis, said the chevalier, turning to me, if you will proceed with the explanation you are about to give, and can really satisfy my mind on that subject, I will stay and take my chance, for I shall no longer fear death for a moment. This declaration, as may easily be supposed, surprised me not a little, after the value which he had before allowed that life possessed in his eyes for whatever might be the interest which he took in me personally and whatever might be the enthusiasm that characterized his mind i could not conceive that without some strong motive superadded he would offer to risk so much for the sake of one in regard to whose innocence he had shown himself almost unwilling to be convinced garcias however permitted no hesitation on the subject stay cried he in an accent of almost indignant astonishment when we have perilled both our lives to gain you the means of going do you talk of staying senor de montenero you are not mad and if you are i am not therefore i say you must go directly without a moment's pause and not allowing another word he hurried him away saw him mount commanded the escort of twenty men who accompanied him to defend him with their lives and then returning to me led the way back to the council hall "'Members of the Supreme Council of Catalonia,' said he abruptly as we entered, "'our first duty is to show to the nation that though we have cast off the yoke of Castile, "'we have not cast off the restraint of law. "'A member of this honourable body has been shot at the very council table "'by a man acting in open rebellion to the authority committed to us by the people. "'We require no evidence of the fact which was committed before our eyes.' if we let the punishment slumber justice and order are at an end anarchy slaughter and confusion must inevitably follow give me your voices noble catalonians i pronounce gil moreno guilty of murder aggravated by treason towards the nation and therefore worthy of death my vote is given he spoke rapidly and sternly and after a momentary hesitation and whispering consultation the rest of the council unanimously agreed in his award. "'Take away the prisoner,' said Garcias, and Moreno was removed. "'Now let some noble seigneur write the sentence,' continued he. "'I am no clerk, but I will attend to the execution of it.' The sentence was accordingly written, and having been signed by all the members of the council, 
Garcias took it, as he said, to have it fixed upon the front of the palace, and left us. His absence, however, had, beyond doubt, another object, for while the corregidor was, according to the direction of the council, writing a dispatch from the provisional government of Catalonia to the prime minister of France, the stern voice of the insurrectionary leader was heard in the square, giving a word of command. Fire! The report of a platoon was instantly heard, and it was not difficult to guess that Moreno had tasted of that fate which he had been so willing to inflict on others. The dispatches were soon prepared, and the council, willing to assume all the pomp of established authority, ordered me to be conducted to the port as one of its members, with all sort of ceremony. Garcias remained at the palace to take measures against any movement on the part of Moreno's partisans, but the corregidor accompanied me to the waterside, and having formally resigned the seat to which I had been called in the council, I embarked on board the brigantine and took my leave for ever of Barcelona. End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight the most humiliating of all the various kinds of human suffering is undoubtedly sea-sickness and therefore i will willingly pass over all my sensations in crossing the gulf of lyons i believe however that the excessive importunity of my corporeal feelings did me good inasmuch as it served for a time to obliterate from my memory the various strange and exciting scenes which i had lately gone through if we could suppose the soul itself to be in a state of ebriety i should say that my mind had been for several days drunk with excess of stimulus and the relaxation consequent upon it during the vacant hours of the voyage would have been actually painful had not the horrors of sea-sickness so employed the body that the mind could not act we landed then at marseilles after a safe and rapid passage and i prepared to set out with all speed for lyons hoping by being the first to bear the cardinal de richelieu news which i well divined would be most joyful to him that i might at all events remove some of the dangers and difficulties of my situation a situation which i hardly dared to contemplate my father though richly endowed with personal courage wanted as i have said that moral courage which leads a man to look everything that is painful or disagreeable boldly in the face with him indeed this disposition was carried to the excess of flying from the contemplation even of inconvenient trifles but enough of it had descended to me to make me willingly turn my eyes from circumstances like those in which i was now placed money i had hardly more than would bear me to paris resources i had none before me and i shrank from the idea of either writing to or hearing from the once loved home that i had left with a degree of horror it is difficult to describe but what could i write without forcing my mind to dwell upon details that were agony to think of what could i hear but reproaches which i knew not well whether i deserved or not or tenderness which would have been more painful still my only resource was like the ostrich in the fable to shut my eyes against the evils that pursued me and to hurry forward as fast as i could filling up the vacuity of each moment with any circumstances less painful than my own thoughts and leaving to time and chance the two great patrons of the unfortunate to remove my difficulties and provide for my wants at the inn at marseilles as soon as my little attendant achilles had recovered what he called his powers of ambulation the rolling of the sea having left him even on land certain sensations of unsteadiness which made him walk in various zigzag meanders during the whole day he unfolded to my astonished eyes the clothes which he had bought for me at barcelona first appeared a splendid spanish riding dress of philomot cloth laced with silver and perfectly new with a black beaver and white plumes which together with the untanned riding boots sword and dagger all handsomely mounted might cost upon a very moderate calculation at least one hundred and fifty louis d'or i concluded myself ruined of course 
but what was my surprise and horror when he dragged forth a long leathern case containing a rich dress suit of white silk laced with gold a white sword and gold hilt a bonnet and plume that might have served a prince with collars of flemish lace gold embroidered gloves of brussels and shoes of cordova if it had been a box of serpents i could not have gazed into it with more horror my purse feeling lighter by a pistole for every fold he unplied in the rich white silk there 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 cried he contemplating them with as much delight as i experienced consternation what an exquisite alexander the great i should make in that white silk never was such an opportunity lost for fitting up the wardrobe of a theatre never never but i could not bear to part with the little shining yellow things that kept my pocket so warm and therefore i only bought what was necessary for you signori and where do you think that my signori is to get money to pay for them demanded i somewhat sharply pray how much have you spent more than i gave you the poor little man looked up with an air of consternation that increased my own spent cried he spent more than you gave me why none at all i got them all for seven louis then they must have been stolen cried i to be sure answered he in a tone of the most naive simplicity in the world to be sure they were stolen how did you think i should come by them else though in no very great mood the tone the air and simplicity of the little player overcame my gravity and i could not help laughing while i asked who they had really belonged to before they came so honestly into his possession lord how should i know replied he if you want to hear how i got them that is easily told when you went away to the council after bidding me buy you a riding suit i went out with Yakomo, as they call him the cook and as we were marching along in search of a fripier we passed by the ruins of the arsenal where you and i were confined and where i killed the savage soldado he continued drawing himself up till he fancied himself full six feet high but that has nothing to do with the matter the arsenal is now in a terrible state partly battered to pieces with the cannon partly blown up as it seemed to me but we just went in and took a look about us when suddenly out from amongst a whole heap of ruins creeps a peasant fellow and these two large males on his back and a heap of other things in a bag round his neck at first he looked frightened but after a little took heart and told us his long story which Yakomo translated for me showing forth that having come to town too late for the famous plunder of the day before he had hunted about amongst the rooms that were yet standing in the arsenal till he had found all the things we saw and added that if we would go on we should find a deal more this however did not suit Yakomo, who talked to him very loudly about taking him before the council and frightened him a good deal after which he made him show us what was in the mails when finding they would suit your lordship i made the cook offer the man seven louis for them though he said i was a great fool for offering so much and that if i would let him he would frighten him so he would give them up for nothing but as i knew you would not wear them without you paid for them i gave the man the money who was very glad to get it and walked away quite contented with that and several other suits which he had besides this information satisfied my conscience and certainly if there never were seven louis better laid out never was apparel more needed for what between my journeys in the pyrenees and my adventures in spain my pourpoint would have qualified me for a high rank amongst those poor chevaliers whom we see frequenting the corners of low taverns and waiting patiently till some solitary traveller without acquaintance or indefatigable tippler abandoned by his mates invites them to share his tankard for the mere sake of company the next thing was to try them on when to my mortification i found that though in point of length they suited me exactly both the pourpoint and the eau de chausse much required the intervention of a pair of shears to reduce the waist to the same circumference as my own a small lean shanked marseillois exercising the honourable office of tailor to the inn was soon procured and setting him down in the corner of the chamber i suffered him not to depart till both the suits were reduced to a just proportion 
and I no longer looked as if I had got into an empty balloon when I again tried them on. One night I suffered to roll past tranquilly, though a thousand phantoms of the last two days hovered about my pillow and disturbed my rest. The next morning, however, a new embarrassment presented itself, for on inquiring for the boats to Lyon, I was informed that it did not depart till the next day, and even then I found it would be so long on its passage that I must abandon all hope of being the first bearer of news from Catalonia, if I pursued so dilatory a mode of travelling. At the same time, I well knew that it was quite out of the question to take poor little Achilles so many hundred miles on horseback. The only way, therefore, which we could determine upon, was for him to remain behind till the boat sailed, and then to make the best of his way to Paris to rejoin me, while I went on as fast as possible, and accomplished my errand in the meanwhile. Being now in France, and having his pockets well garnished, little Achilles did not, of course, feel himself near so much at a loss as he would have done in Spain, but still he clung about me, and whimpered like a baby to see me depart. I believe that he had seldom known kindness before, and he estimated it as a jewel from its rarity. He made one request, however, before I departed, with which, though unwillingly, I could not refuse to comply. My scruple of conscience about the diamonds, of which he had plundered the house of Monsieur de Villafranca, had in some degree touched his own, and he had heroically resolved to return them if ever he found the opportunity, always, however, reserving the right to make use of any part of them in case either his own or my occasions should require it. But in the meantime he remained under the most dreadful anxiety lest he should be robbed on the way to Paris, and made it his most humble request, both as I was the most valiant of the two, and as I should be a less space of time on the road, that I would take charge of the packet in which they were enveloped. I did as he wished, though I would willingly have been excused, and having left him to shed his tender tears over our separation, I mounted the post-horse that had been brought me, and set out on my journey for Paris. The night's rest which I had taken at Marseilles served me till I arrived at Lyon, and the one which I indulged in there carried me on to Paris. No time was lost on my journey, a single word concerning dispatches for the minister making doors fly open, and horses gallop better than the magic rings of the fairy tales. At length I began to see the villages growing nearer and nearer together, separate houses highly ornamented and decorated, yet not large enough to dignify themselves with the name of chateau. Troops of people seemingly returning from some great city to their homes in the country, strings of carts and horses, and, in short, everything announcing the proximity of a metropolis while at the same time the sound of a multitude of bells came borne upon the wind towards me, telling me that I arrived at some moment of great public rejoicing. I will not stop to inquire why that sound fell so heavily upon my heart, but so it did, and all the increasing gaiety I met as I began to enter into the suburbs, but rendered me the more melancholy. It was by this time beginning to grow dusk, and directing my horse towards the Cartier saint eustache I alighted at a small auberge which our landlord at Marseilles had recommended as the best in Paris. Having taken off my baggage with my own hands, and paid my postillion, I looked about in the little courtyard for someone to show me an apartment. It was long, however, before I could find anyone, and even at last the only person I could meet with was an old woman, the great-grandmother of mine host, I believe, who told me that all the world were out at the fete, and that I might sit down in the salle à manger if I liked till they came back. This seemed but poor entertainment for the best auberge in Paris, but I was forced to content myself with what I found, for it was too late to seek another lodging, even had I not appointed Achilles to meet me there. Nor, indeed, was my companion, the old woman, very entertaining for she was so deaf that she heard not one word I said, and merely replied to all my inquiries on whatever subject they were made, by informing me that every one was at the fete, repeating the precise words she made use of before. Thus passed the time for an hour, but then the face of affairs altered. The host, a jolly aubergiste, as ever roasted a capon, 
rushed in in his best attire, followed by his wife and his sister, and his sister's husband, all half inebriated with good spirits, and I was soon at my desire shown to an apartment which, though small, was sufficiently clean, and having been told that supper would be ready at the table d'hote in an hour, I waited, while the various odours rising up from the kitchen to my window seemed sent on purpose to inform me, step by step, of the progress of the meal. Alone, in Paris, unknown to a soul, with a vacant hour lying open before me, it was impossible any longer to avoid that unkind friend, thought. For a moment or two I walked up and down the little chamber, whose antique furniture, the precise allotted portion which a traveller could not do without, called to my mind the old but splendid garnishing of my apartments at the Chateau de Lorme. Where, I asked myself, were all the familiar objects that habit had rendered dear to my eye? Where all the little trifles round which memory lingers, even after time has torn her away from things of greater import? Where were the grand mountains whose vast masses would even now have been stretching dark and sublime across the twilight sky before my windows? Where the free breeze that wafted health with every blast? Where were the eyes whose glance was sunshine, and the voices whose tones were music, and the hearts whose happiness had centred in me alone? What had I instead? A petty chamber, in a petty inn, the rank close atmosphere of a swarming city, and the eternal clang of scolding, lying, blaspheming tongues, rising up with a din that would have deafened a cyclop, while misery and vice and want and sorrow cabal and treason and treachery and crime were working around me in the thousand narrow jammed-up cells of that great infernal hive such was the picture that imagination contrasted with the sweet calm scene which memory portrayed and casting myself down on the bed i hid my face on the clothes giving way to a burst of passionate sorrow that relieved me with unmanly but still with soothing tears while i yet lay there i heard some one move in the chamber and starting suddenly up i saw a man carefully examining my baggage with a very suspicious and nonchalant air who the devil are you cried i laying my hand on my sword garçon de l'auberge ne vous déplaise monsieur replied the man then monsieur garçon de l'auberge said i Beware how you touch my baggage, for though there be nothing in it but my clothes and a packet for his eminence the cardinal, I shall take care to slit your nose if you finger it without orders. The man started back at the name of the cardinal, as if he had touched a viper, gave me the monseigneur immediately, and replied that he came to tell me supper was served, and the guests about to place themselves at table. Following him down, I found the salle à manger tenanted by about ten persons, while upon the table smoked a savoury and plentiful supper, on which they but waited the presence of the host to fall with somewhat wolfish appetites. Silence reigned omnipotent at the first course, but at the second two or three of the guests, more loquacious than the rest, began to entertain themselves and their neighbours with their own importance. One, whose beard was as black and shaggy as a hawthorn tree in winter, spoke of his exploits in war, and showed himself a very Caesar, at least in words. Another was all-powerful in love, and told of many a cunning passé, which he had put upon jealous husbands and careful relations. No female heart had ever resisted him, according to his account, which was the more extraordinary, as he was the ugliest of human beings. This he acknowledged, however, in some degree, swearing he knew not what the poor fools found to love in him. A third was a mighty man of state, talked in a low voice, and told all the news. He had seen, he said, a certain great man that day, whom it was dangerous to name, and he could tell, if he liked, a mighty secret. But no, he would not, he was afraid of their indiscretion. Then again, however, he changed his mind, and would... They were all discreet men, he was sure. The news was this. It was undoubted, he could assure them. Portugal had again fallen under the dominion of Spain. He had it from the best authority. The means of the counter-revolution was this. The Viceroy of Catalonia 
had sent twenty thousand men by Gibraltar straight to Portugal, where they had uncrowned the Duke of Braganza and restored King Philip, for which great service the king had appointed the Viceroy of Catalonia his Prime Minister. As I knew how much of this news was truth, I of course gave the politician his due share of credit, and judging the rest of the company from the specimen he afforded, I was rather inclined to imagine that the lover's face made a truer report of his achievements than his tongue, and that, perhaps, the beard of the soldado constituted the most efficient part of his valour. I did not, however, seek to inquire into particulars, but remained as silent as several plain-looking, respectable shopkeepers who sat near me, and only opened my mouth to ask if I could procure someone to guide me that evening to a place I wished to visit in the town. This was addressed to my next neighbour, who had himself shown no symptoms of loquacity. But it caught the ears of the man of the sword, who had been admiring the lace upon my riding-suit, with somewhat the expression of a cat looking into a vase of goldfish. And he instantly proposed, in a very patronising manner, to be my conductor himself. "'I have half an hour to spare, young sir,' said he. "'Your countenance pleases me, and I am willing to bestow that leisure upon you.' you do not know paris and the strange folks you may meet my presence will be a protection to you i replied that i wanted no protection that i had always been able hitherto to protect myself but that i was obliged by his offer of guiding me and would accept it having taken care to lock the door of my chamber before i came down and having the dispatch from barcelona about me the moment we had done dinner i accompanied the complacent soldier into the street and then begged him to show me to the palais cardinal the name seemed to startle him a little but he bade me follow him which i accordingly did for about a quarter of an hour he went up one street and down another turning and returning like a hare pursued by the dogs till at length i began to perceive that the very last intention of my worthy guide's mind was to conduct me to the palais cardinal which i well knew was not half a mile from the quartier saint eustache as he went, my honest companion amused me with the detail of a great many adventures, in which he had proved himself a Hercules, and carried on the conversation with such spirit that he had it all to himself. What he intended to do with me, God knows. But getting rather tired of walking about the streets, I fixed upon a respectable-looking grocer's shop, which was not yet closed, and telling my companion that I wanted to buy some pepper, I walked in. Pepper? cried he, following me. What can you want with pepper? I will tell you presently, I answered, when I have asked this good gentleman, the grocer, a question. Pray, sir, I continued, turning to the master of the house, will you inform me if I am near the Palais Cardinal? This worthy person agreed to guide me thither from the Rue des Prouvaires, Cartier saint Eustache, and we have walked near half an hour without finding it. "'He has taken you quite to the other end of the town,' replied the grocer. "'You are now, sir, in the Rue des Prêtres, St. Paul.' "'On oh, my life!' cried the soldier. "'I thought I was leading you right. "'By my honour, tis a strange mistake.' "'So strange, sir,' said I, "'that if you do not instantly go to the right about and march off, "'I may be tempted to cudgel you.' "'Vendre saint gris!' cried the bully, laying his hand on his sword." but the grocer whispered a word or two to his shop-boy about fetching the Capitaine de Gouet, and the great soldier, finding that his honour was likely to suffer less by retreating than by maintaining his ground, took to his heels and ran off with all speed. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 That, sir, is one of the most assured rogues in Paris, said the grocer. He has once been at the galleys for seven years, and will very soon be there again. How you happened to fall in with such a fellow, I do not at all understand. I explained to the shopkeeper the circumstances, and he shook his head gravely at the name of the inn. "'It is not a good reputation,' said he. "'And as to its being the best in Paris,' he added with a laugh, "'we Parisians would be very much ashamed of it if it was. 
However, sir, as you want to go to the Palais Cardinal, my boy shall conduct you there, and though I wish to take away no one's character, be upon your guard at your inn. There are many ways of plundering a stranger in this good city, and if you need any assistance, send to me, though I am very bold to say so, for a gentleman of your figure must have many friends here, doubtless. Only I know something of the good people where you lodge, and, possibly, might manage them better than another. I thanked him for his kindness most sincerely, for though, perhaps, ever too much accustomed to rely upon myself, yet I will own there was a solitary desolateness of feeling crept about my heart in that great city, which made it a relief to feel that there was somebody who took even a transient interest in me, and to whom I could apply for advice or aid, in case I needed it. After taking down my new friend's address, I followed his shop-boy out into the street, and we pursued our way towards the Palais Cardinal, exactly retreading the steps which my former valiant guide had made me take. All the way we went, the lad chattered with true Parisian activity of tongue, telling a thousand curious and horrible tales of the great but cruel man that I was about to see, and relating all the anecdotes of the day concerning his dark and mysterious policy. "'No one knows,' said the boy, "'why he does anything, or how he does anything. "'It was only last week that the strangest thing happened in the world. "'You have heard of the great wood of Marley, monsieur. "'Well, one of the cardinal's servants was ordered on Thursday last week "'to take an ass loaded with pure gold into that wood, "'and go on upon the road till he met a man who asked him "'if the sun shone at midnight.' and then give him the ass's bridle and come away so the servant went in and after going a mile or more he met a tall fine man somewhat dark however who asked him does the sun shine at midnight so the servant said nothing but gave him the bridle the stranger was not satisfied with that but counted all the bags of gold upon the ass's back and then told the servant to take it to the person who had sent it and say that he had counted and watched but the sun did not shine at midnight yet. So then the servant did as he bade him, and took it back to the cardinal, who put two more sacks upon the ass and sent the lackey back again. When he met the same man and everything passed as before, except that when he had counted the gold, the stranger shouted, Ha ha! The sun shines at midnight, and jumping upon the donkey's back, he gave him a kick with his foot, which made him gallop as quick as any horse and the servant never saw them any more. "'Lord, Lord, is that not very strange, monsieur?' continued the boy, and creeping close to me, he added, "'They say that the tall stranger was the devil, and that the cardinal had made a bargain with him that if he would give him all the wit he desired, hell should have his soul at the end of twenty years. But when the twenty years were out, he wanted very much a few years more.' so that he was obliged to make a new bargain and pay a good round sum as interest upon his bond the conclusion of the boy's story brought us to the end of the rue saint honore and shortly after he pointed out the façade of the palais cardinal having rewarded him with a crown and sent him away very well contented i gazed up at the splendid building before me whose grand features massed together in the darkness seemed almost as frowning and gloomy as a prison the news which I brought, however, I was sure would be acceptable, and therefore, walking on, I was about to approach the house when I was challenged by a sentinel. I told him my business, and requested he would show me my way to any of the offices, for I perceived no ready means of gaining admission. The soldier passed me on to another, who again passed me on to the corps de garde, from whence I was taken to a small door and delivered as a bale of goods, into the hands of a grim-looking man who told me at once that i could not see the minister who was abroad at the moment pray what is your business with his eminence demanded the porter it is business replied i with which you my friend can have no concern and business of such import that i must stay till i see him come with me said the porter after thinking a moment and he then led me across a court wherein a carriage was standing with horses harnessed and torches burning at the doors. "'Monsieur de Noyer, one of the secretaries of state, is here,' he added, seeing me remark the carriage, "'and you can speak with him.' 
my business is with his eminence the cardinal replied i and with him alone well come with me come with me said the porter if your business be really important you must see some one who is competent to speak on it and if it be not important you had better not have come here thus saying he led me into a small hall and thence into a cabinet beyond hung with fine tapestry and lighted by a single silver lamp here he bade me sit down and left me in a few minutes a door on the other side of the room opened and a cavalier entered dressed in a rich suit of black velvet with a hat and plume he was tall thin and pale with a clear bright eye and fine decided features his beard was small and pointed and his face oval and somewhat sharp and though there was a slight stoop of his neck and shoulders as if time or disease had somewhat enfeebled his frame yet it took nothing from the dignity of his demeanour he started and seemed surprised at seeing any one there but then immediately advanced and looked at me for a moment with a glance which read deeply whatever lines it fell upon who are you demanded he what do you want what paper is that in your hand my name replied i is louis count de lorme my business is with the cardinal de richelieu and this paper is one that i am charged to deliver into his hand give it to me said the stranger holding out his hand my eye glanced over his unclerical habiliments and i replied you must excuse me this paper and the farther news i bring can only be given to the cardinal himself it shall go safe he answered in a stern tone give it to me young sir there was an authority in his tone that almost induced me to comply but reflecting that i might be called to a severe account by the unrelenting minister even for a mere error in judgment i persisted in my original determination i must repeat answered i that i can give this to no one but his eminence himself without an express order from his own hand to do so Pshaw! cried he with something of a smile and taking up a pen which lay with some sheets of paper on the table he dipped it in the ink and scrawled in a large bold hand deliver your packet to the bearer richelieu i made him a low bow and placed the letter in his hands he read it with the quick and intelligent glance of one enabled by long habit to recollect and arrange the ideas conveyed to him with that clear rapidity possessed alone by men of genius in the meantime i watched his countenance seeking to detect amongst all the lines with which years and thought had channelled it any expression of the stern vindictive despotic passions which the world charged him withal and which his own action sufficiently evinced it was not there however all was calm suddenly raising his eyes his look fell full upon me as i was thus busily scanning his countenance and i know not why but my glance sunk in the collision ha said he rather mildly than otherwise you are gazing at me very strictly sir are you a reader of countenances not in the least monseigneur replied i i was but learning a lesson to know a great man when i see one another time that answer sir would make many a courtier's fortune said the minister nor shall it mar yours though i understand it remember flattery is never lost at a court tis the same there as with a woman if it be too thick she may wipe some of it away as she does her rouge but she will take care not to brush off all to be detected in flattery has something in it so degrading that the blood rushed up into my cheek with the burning glow of shame a slight smile curled the minister's lips come sir he continued i am going forth for half an hour but i may have some questions to ask you therefore i will beg you to wait my return do not stir from this spot there you will find food for the mind he proceeded pointing out a small case of books in other respects you shall be taken care of i need not warn you to discretion you have proved that you possess that quality and i do not forget it thus speaking he left me and for a few minutes i remained struggling with the flood of turbulent thoughts which such an interview pours upon the mind this then was the great and extraordinary minister who at that moment held in his hands the fate of half europe the powers of whose mind like niorda 
the tempest god of the ancient gauls raised guided and enjoyed the winds and the storms triumphing in the thunders of continual war and the whirlwinds of political intrigue in a short time two servants brought in a small table of lapis lazuli on which they proceeded to spread various sorts of rare fruits and wines putting on also a china cup and a vase which i supposed to contain coffee a beverage that i had often heard mentioned by my good preceptor father francis who had tasted it in the east but which i had never before met with all this was done with the most profound silence and with a gliding ghost-like step which must certainly have been learned in the prisons of the inquisition at length one of these stealthy attendants desired me in the name of his lord to take some refreshment and then with a low reverence quitted the cabinet as if afraid i should make him any answer i could not help thinking as they left me what a system of terror must that be which could drill any two frenchmen into silence like this however i approached the table and indulged myself with a cup of most exquisite coffee after which i examined the bookcase and glancing my eye over histories and tragedies and essays and treatises i fixed at length upon ovid from a sort of instinctive feeling that the mind when it wishes to fly from itself and the two sad realities of human existence assimilates much more easily with anything imaginative than with anything true i was still reading and though sometimes falling into long lapses of thought i was nevertheless highly enjoying the beautiful fictions of the poet when the door was again opened and the minister reappeared i instantly laid down the book and rose but pointing to a chair he bade me be seated and taking up my book turned over the pages for a few moments while a servant brought him a cup of fresh coffee and a biscuit are you fond of ovid demanded he at length and then without allowing me time to reply he added he is my favourite author i read him more than any other book the tone which he took was that of easy common conversation which two persons perfectly equal in every respect might be supposed to hold upon any indifferent subject and i of course answered in the same ovid i said is certainly one of my favourite poets but i am afraid of reading him so often as i should wish for there is an enervating tendency in all his writings which i should fear would greatly relax the mind it is for that very reason that i read him replied the minister it is alone when i wish for relaxation that i read and then after every thought having been in activity for a whole long day ovid is like a bed of roses to the mind where it can repose itself and recruit its powers of action for the business of another this was certainly not the conversation which i expected and i paused without making any reply thinking that the minister would soon enter upon those important subjects on which i could give the best and latest information but on the contrary he proceeded with ovid there is a constant struggle continued he between feeling and reason in the human breast in youth it is wisely ordained that feeling should have the ascendancy and she rules like a monarch with an imagination for her minister though by the way he added with a passing smile so slight that it scarcely curled his lip though by the way the minister is often much more active than the monarch in after years when feeling has done for man all that feeling was intended to do and carried him into a thousand follies eventually very beneficial to himself and to the human race reason succeeds to the throne to finish what feeling left undone and to remedy what she did wrong now you are in the age of feeling and i am in the age of reason and the consequence is that even in reading such a book as ovid what we cull is as different as the wax and the honey which the bee gathers from the same flower what touches you is the wit and brilliancy of the thought the sweetness of the poetry the bright and luxurious pictures which are presented to your imagination while all that affects me little and shadowed through a thousand splendid allegories i see great and sublime truths robed as it were by the verse and the poetry in a radiant garment of light what can be a truer picture of an ambitious and a daring minister than ixion embracing a cloud and he looked me full in the face with a smile of melancholy meaning 
to which I did not well know how to reply. "'I have certainly never considered of it in that light,' replied I, "'and I have to thank your eminence for the pleasure I shall doubtless enjoy in tracing the allegories throughout.' "'The thanks are not my due,' replied the minister. "'An English statesman, near a century ago, wrote a book upon the subject, "'and showed his own wisdom while he pointed out that of the ancients. "'In England the reign of reason is much stronger than it is with us in France, "'though they may be considered as a younger people.' "'Then does your eminence consider,' demanded I, "'that the change from feeling to reason proceeds apace with the age of nations as well as with men?' "'In general, I think it does,' replied he. "'Nations set out bold, generous, hasty, carried away by impulse rather than by thought, "'easily led, but not easily governed. "'Gradually, however, they grow politic, careful, anxious to increase their wealth, somewhat indolent.' till at length they creep into their dotage, even like men. But, he added after a pause, the world is too young for us to talk about the history of nations. All we know is that they have their different characters like different men, and of course some will preserve their vigour longer than others. Some will die violent deaths, some end by sudden diseases, some by slow decay. A hundred thousand years hence men may know what nations are, and judge what they will be it suffices at present to know our contemporaries and to rule them by that knowledge and now monsieur le comte de long i thank you for a pleasant hour and i wish you good night of course you are still at an inn when you have fixed your lodging leave your address here and you shall hear from me in the meanwhile farewell of course i rose and taking leave quitted the palais cardinal what it may be asked, without one word on the important business which had brought you there? Without a word? The name of Catalonia was never mentioned, and yet the very next day large bodies of men marched upon Roussillon. More were instantly directed thither from every part of the country. The fleet in the Mediterranean sailed for Barcelona, and in a space of time inconceivably brief, Catalonia was furnished with every supply necessary to carry on a long and active war. End of chapter 29